going to move to the industry side of things. And we will have Paul Schuler come and speak. So Paul is the Director of External Affairs for the Americas for Oil Spill Response Limited. He was formerly um, CEO of Clean Caribbean and Americas, and he is a recognized expert on international aspects of oil spill preparedness and response, in particular on the science and use of dispersants to combat, um, to combat oil spills. Well, thank you very much. I'm following some great presentations and uh, learning quite a bit. Uh, so it's a pleasure to be here. <clears throat> I changed the title a little bit because it's not only about science, but in the response side, it's about the technology that supports the science as well. So if uh, there are things you may like to do, but if you don't have the technology to accomplish them, which is pretty much the case in Deepwater Horizon at the beginning, and I'll show you some things that have, have changed since. So I'm going to talk about science and, and technology. What I like to start out with is saying that uh, there's been quite a bit talked about the uh, area contingency plans. And uh, a couple days after the explosion at Deepwater Horizon well, uh, we were mobilized and we flew from Fort Lauderdale over to um, Gulfport, Mississippi and started doing spray operations. And um, when we did this, and I, I'm not sure a lot of people are aware of it, we had a, a designated uh, oil to dispersant oil ratio. We were trying to hit one to 20, uh, which comes out to five gallons per acre or 50 liters per hectare. Uh, this was based on the oil slick being uh, 0.1 millimeters uh, which is generally what an oil split gets to after about 12 to 24 hours. So where did this come from? And there, the, the, the reality is that there was a lot of science leading up to Deepwater Horizon that was incorporated in the area contingency plan. And uh, Mr. Wenner said it, it's uh, the area contingency plan is kind of the Bible. So uh, um, this was not a cavalier thing to do. It was a planned thing to do. And if there was a spill tomorrow, um, the, there are plans to do pretty much the same thing uh, with, with some changes based on things that were learned at Deepwater Horizon. So when you have a spill, there are only about five or six things you can do. And these are them. This is our toolbox. You can monitor, which in some cases is all that's need to be done. Um, there are some things that happen simultaneously, like uh, source control, um, which is not necessarily responding to the oil, but trying to stop the flow of oil. And then these other things, uh, containment or chemical dispersants, burning, shoreline cleanup, cleanup that, that, those are our tools and that's all we have. And that's what we're gonna uh, be pulling out of the toolbox. Generally speaking, all of them. Uh, you know, there's one that or two that may predominate, but generally speaking, at some point of, for a large spill, they all get in use. Um, what drives it? Well, certainly one thing is what is the science and technology? What's the available resources to respond to a spill? But the other things are the health and safety of the community and responders, the feasibility, sometimes the weather or geography or logistics infrastructure prevents you from doing things. Uh, as Brad mentioned in his five questions, our first question is always what kind of oil, because that's going to determine what you can and cannot do. Uh, resources at risk is very important. That also determines what priorities you're going to do things on. Um, available resources. I looked at the map you just showed of the area contingency plan. And I say, yeah, that's kind of neat that you got all those booming things, lines there, but where are you going to get the boom from? So, so that's an issue. Um, <clears throat> um, some of these other things, net environmental benefit analysis, I'm going to talk about in a moment uh, with, as uh, falling back to Brad's talk again about Dr. Spock there. Um, and most importantly, you have whatever you choose, you have to match your, your response with the resources and, and with the scale of the oil spill. So you'll see certain things. And one of the reasons we get driven towards dispersants is that mechanical recovery simply is not gonna 
make that big a dent in a large oil spill. So uh, this is my um, analogy of Dr. Spock. How many of here have heard of the tropics experiment? Whoa, wow, that's, that's better than most times. So this started back in 1984, and this is one of the seminal studies that determined the concept of net environmental benefit analysis. It was an area in Panama that had coral, seagrass, and mangroves in close proximity. And there were three areas studied. One is a reference area about a mile away. The other was some oil was, this was pure crude oil was spilled and this area had dispersed crude oil. And you can see the pure crude oil stays on the surface, goes in and oils the mangroves, gets stuck in the, the substrate, um, does some damage to the seagrass and the mangroves. But generally speaking, the trade-off here is that the oil on the surface doesn't impact the coral very much. The, the trade-off when you disperse the oil is that the oil goes into the mangroves, but because it's dispersed, it tends to come back out. It doesn't adhere to the roots. Um, the seagrass gets on the crustaceans in it, get, uh, or invertebrates get somewhat damaged and uh, have mortality. But you can see in this case now you have the coral has some exposure to, to the oil. So this is the typical trade-off that we deal with in looking at net environmental benefit analysis. Um, and as we look further at, um, at the use of dispersants, you'll see that that's a trade-off. It's the water column versus the shoreline. And I'll talk about in a minute about uh, Deepwater Horizon. So based on the fact that uh, we have science available looking at these kind of things, there were decisions made back in the 80s to design a system for putting in the back of a Hercules to spray during a spill, to spray dispersants. Now, if the science wasn't there, quite honestly, we wouldn't have this system. We're only going to buy equipment and capabilities that we know are accepted and can be used. If it can't be, then there's no point in us, us having them. This happens to be a training exercise we did off of Fort Lauderdale in December of 2009. Uh, where we loaded what's called the Airborne Dispersant Delivery System in the back of a Hercules. And we used to fly with the Coast Guard a lot as well up at Air Station Clearwater. We went out off the coast of uh, between Miami, Fort Lauderdale. We had a spotter plane practicing uh, spray on, spray off, all the sort of things we did. And uh, we did the exact same thing on April 24th. Uh, 2010, which instead of flying off the coast, we flew up to Gulfport, Mississippi, and we began an 83-day deployment where we had uh, 80 sorties of flying over the Deepwater Horizon area and generally spraying between the Deepwater Horizon uh, well area and this shoreline uh, in this area here. Um, we also have a stockpile of dispersants. And again, we wouldn't have it if it wasn't known to be approved. So it's on the National Contingency Plan uh, product schedule that uh, EPA is in charge of maintaining. What are the relative advantages? Well, here's the typical trade-off, a slick on the surface or, or dispersed oil. With uh, being on the surface, the wind vector is what generally drives it ashore. And um, if it's in the uh, dispersed into the water column, uh, you remove the wind vector and generally uh, prevent a lot of the oil from going ashore. This was what exactly what was done in Deepwater Horizon, where there was a political decision to pr uh, preserve the shoreline. And, and it might be a different decision at a different kind of shoreline, but the Louisiana shoreline is very sensitive and they're losing a lot of shoreline and the marshes, as we heard earlier, is a high sensitivity. So by dispersing the oil out here, um, you remove the wind vector. Here's the current vector. Uh, remove the wind vector and it tends to prevent a lot of oil from going ashore. That's what was being done. 
then you're looking at a, a, a couple of three weeks to see that dispersed oil uh, gets into the, the food chain in terms of yeah, bacterial colonization and it works its way up. So over the course of a couple of three weeks, uh, we have biodegradation take place. Uh, everybody, I'm not going to spend much time on this, but we do know all the chemical components of dispersant. Uh, this is not intended to be a dispersant talk. Um, and we have stockpiles of it. And we have a, a global dispersant stockpile with dispersant in the UK, in Bahrain, in Singapore, uh, Rio, and Fort Lauderdale, so that we have enough to do what I'll talk about more of subsea dispersion injection for up to 30 days. So these are just some of the concepts that we look at. Again, I, I don't want to go into these too deeply, but the key is to look at that trade-off when you're either looking at what we call net environmental benefit analysis, or the new term is spill impact mitigation uh, assessment, actually not analysis. So what I think it'd be, uh, I've done some of these workshops with Monica and the, and the C grant team before, and I'm, I was trying to decide what's the, what's the best message to leave you? And I think I could talk about SEMA for a long time. I could talk about NEBA, I could talk about tropics. I can also talk about how dispersants work chemically and physically. But I think one of the best things to leave you with is what would a spill look like and what a dispersant's role in a spill. Because I think sometimes we're so caught up with trying to message some of the ways we think and develop strategies that we fail to look at the big picture. So let's just take a look very briefly about a subsea well blowout or what we call a loss of subsea well control. And so you're going to have uh, the oil come out with quite a bit of energy generally and create a plume at some particular area, usually about two to three to 400, uh, 4,000 uh, feet above, you get a, a trapping layer with fine particles. The large particles, large droplets go rather quickly and you get surface expression here. Uh, these smaller droplets may be entrained in the trapping zone for a long time. And uh, in the Gulf of Mexico, there's an oxygen rich layer of Antarctic uh, uh, current uh, water at the bottom. So there was some aerobic uh, de degradation here. Uh, that's, that's a good thing. Uh, but one of the things we get up top is a, a high level of VOCs, um, volatile organic compounds, and those right up top is where the workers need to work to try to control this well or, or drill a relief well. So uh, a combination of factors is one of the reasons we like to do this subsea injection, which is to put target to dispersant right at the wellhead, um, is to knock down those VOCs so people can actually work up here and shut in this well. It's a major consideration in uh, what we do when there's a, 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 a subsea blowout, of which there haven't been many. But this is the deep water horizon taken from a satellite. Um, I talk about scale. You can see this is a skimming vessel that ran through here. Not really in the big picture doing that much, um, which is why with the surface expression, we're looking at using dispersants to break this up before it gets too close to land or sensitive resources. This is the, these are all the folks working above the well, trying to do a variety of things to, to control that well. And uh, needless to say, the, the VOCs in the atmosphere that they're working in is gonna either, uh, if we do subsea dispersant injection, a lot of the, um, VOCs uh, dissolve on the way up, and we look at a, in, uh, a lower VOC environment and a better place for them to work. If uh, the VOC environment uh, atmosphere gets very high, everyone needs to go into special PPE, and the work is going to just slow down or stop. 
I, I mentioned you saw the picture of the um, Hercules spraying the dispersant on uh, uh, the Gulf of Mexico. Since Deepwater Horizon, um, our company has taken two 727s and converted them to spray aircraft. So this is kind of the next generation. The idea is that they can get places quite a bit faster. And we're, we're a global uh, response organization. So uh, we keep our two 727s based in the UK and basically they can go anywhere in the world <clears throat> rather quickly. And, and in places like Brazil where you and the Gulf of Mexico actually, where you may be going out 200 miles the uh, ferry time is quite long in the Hercules, which is uh, pretty much of a slow mover. So what I'm saying here is uh, once you have a, an incident, you're going to have some, um, some surface expression of the oil coming out of the well and the area contingency plan and the, the variety of plans there are to uh, allow you to drill and operate uh, pretty much at this point, say, get dispersants out there. It's because we can get out there quickly on day one, day two, uh, in order to get the mechanical recovery equipment going, the logistics are days, um, and again, not quite as effective. Ultimately, you're gonna see all of those tools brought into play. So let me just walk you through a little bit, and I'll do this rather quickly, um, of what a response would look like. So we have a subsea well, uh, here, here's the blowout preventer, which failed in Deepwater Horizon. Uh, the first thing we need to do is a survey and figure out what's going on and see if we have access to the BOP. One of the good things that happened in Deepwater Horizon was the, the platform and, and all the structure fell away from it and not on top of the wellhead, which would have been a, another problem altogether. So you take a look at this. Um, the next step would be to, uh, if once you have access and, and we have equipment to do use the local ROVs, but do we have tools for cutting and debris removal, uh, clear the way so that we have access to the BOP. So the second thing we're gonna do, and all this time we're talking about a release of oil, is to see if we can put some equipment down on the sea bottom that gives us the power necessary to do a, a BOP intervention and try to shut the BOP. If it works, we're halfway done. Uh, but uh, in the case of deep water, the, the BOP intervention did not work. There was a problem with the BOP. So we still have oil coming out and we're on day two, three, four right now. So what we can do very quickly uh, is to take a, a couple ROVs now and do the next phase is if we still have oil coming out, we do subsea uh, dispersant injection. Now, when we fly and, and spray oil on the surface, we're targeting and maybe getting something on the order of 80 to 90% dispersant on the oil. If you're down at subsea, you're putting the, the dispersant wand right into the plume, so you're getting 100%. And again, by knocking down the dispersion here, uh, forming small droplets, uh, gets slower rise, more, more dispersion into the water column, we improve the VOC uh, atmosphere above. So this could happen on day three or four, depending on how far out the, the well is, and we have enough dispersion to uh, continue this operation while we're getting the capping stacks ready. Again, on the surface, other things can happen, be that uh, more dispersant in situ burning, which was used extensively in Deepwater Horizon, and by uh, three, day three, four, five, six, you're starting to get your surface mechanical recovery capability going and deployed. But there's a lot of logistics to this, and some of the wells out in the Gulf of Mexico are almost 200 miles out. So it's a long way out. Uh, and uh, you saw from that other slide, uh, a limited capability to recover oil. 
Uh, this is one of the capping stacks that we have in Brazil. Um, we're an international organization. Our capping stacks are in Brazil, Norway, South Africa, and Singapore. Um, I'm using this as an example. Uh, there are two organizations in the Gulf of Mexico that have their own capping stacks, and they're based in the Houston, Galveston area. But these things are, are huge, and, uh, and the mobilization and deployment of them takes some time, maybe two, three, four weeks. Um, so we have a couple different types. There are a few different kinds in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, again, this just gives you some sense of what we're talking about. We can also fly our capping stack somewhere. And then there's uh, the, the problem always is trying to get a vessel, uh, <clears throat> which is not a hard thing in the Gulf of Mexico, but in some other parts of the world to get a suitable vessel with a suitable crane is quite a challenge. So then this is what it would look like uh, with the subsea tree here and bringing a capping stack down. Now, when we bring a capping stack and land it on the top of a, a well that's lost well control, all the flanges and valves are wide open so that the oil goes right through the capping stack. And what we do then is very, there's four different chokes on it. And what we would do is slowly choke down. And this was a big concern during Deepwater Horizon was do we have well integrity? If you just put it on and closed it, um, there, it's possible that you would have oils coming up through the substrate. So we put it on with uh, chokes open and then very slowly try to choke down on it and at the time keep and look at the well pressures and well integrity. If you have good well integrity, then we can shut it in and then the relief well and, and permanent shut in will go on. If you don't have good well integrity, we have a system called containment and flowback where we would actually go from the well, we'd set up a number of, uh, we can actually do three legs to actually bring the oil back up to uh, ships that can treat it up in the surface. So that's, that's kind of the, the look at how this would go. Uh, this is the containment part. Again, you can see there's quite a few ships required. We call this simultaneous operations because there's a lot that goes on at one time, including the surface response, which is more conventional. So this is just some of what we sent to deep water. Now, uh, in terms of science, uh, my organization gets involved with science. We sponsor some, we're involved in some of it. Um, the tropics experiment, uh, Brad and, and Abigail Renniger and I were down there a couple years ago uh, doing some data collection. Uh, we've been involved in a number of things. But one thing I'm involved with is taking what we call a counter historical look at Deepwater Horizon. And what we're looking at basically is two things. Uh, what would have happened, and we have a bunch of different cases, uh, what, is, what, what actually occurred in Deepwater Horizon? And that's to the best uh, effort to model it. And then what would have happened if we didn't use uh, any dispersant? What would have happened if we used um, the, the uh, no um, subsea dispersant injection? And Deepwater Horizon was the first time subsea dispersant in, injection was actually tried. So we, we have these six different cases and we're modeling the physical or the mass balance, where did the oil go? And then we're taking a look at um, what, what additional or um, resources would have been impacted. So this study is ongoing right now and we're hoping to conclude it at the end of the year. So it's a lot of modeling, but really two dimensions. If we didn't use dispersants, what we're expecting to see is the extent of the slick impacting the shoreline would be greater and consequently the um, impact on sensitive resources would have been greater. But it's all, uh, some, some of this work is turning on the model and letting the computer sit for a week and run through. So uh, I think this is going to be a real interesting uh, thing to take a look at. Um, 
I just want to mention that after Deepwater Horizon, the industry got together and said uh, there were three different areas they were looking at. One is what can we do for prevention, what for intervention, and what for spill response. And, and these have been uh, multi-million dollar projects by the international oil and gas industry. For, for um, oil spill response, it came up with a number of good practice guides, <clears throat> which include strategies, response, preparedness, and impacts. So all of these are available, uh, here it is again, in a number of uh, good practice guides that are available online. Um, there tend to be uh, fairly deep uh, uh, studies on all of these, but if you want to know much about how the industry is going to approach oil spill response, uh, these are, are where you can learn. Uh, this, this is what we call the tiered response wheel, uh, and this basically shows 15 different um, areas that we look at when we do a, a response or when we plan for one and there's pretty much a good practice guide for each. Dispersants, logistics, waste management, uh, shoreline cleanup, uh, the whole gamut. And so uh, they're, they're very available. I would say that the work that the C Grant folks do, uh, I think they're universally recognized by academia, by regulators, by industry as really, really excellent uh, work with the synthesized science. And um, that's generally what we do. Um, I would say one thing, when it comes to science, I'm gonna be at a workshop in California in a few months on science and, and response with NOAA. And when it comes to science, um, we're willing to listen to just about anything, anything, any science, any technology before a spill and the preparedness side. When there's actually a spill, it's now we're gonna go into the response mode. And the idea of taking on all kinds of new ideas uh, is just not gonna happen in the first three, four or five days. If it becomes a long-term thing, but then we're gonna look at additional new methods, new science. But for that first week, everyone's in the crisis mode and it's probably not, not gonna bring in new ideas at that point. So I will close with saying that uh, one of the things science does, it gives us um, good answers to problems that may seem uh, obvious something else. And this is the 1993 oil spill right on St. Pete Beach here. My folks live in, in uh, Tierra, uh, Tierra Verde for 43 years. And, and, uh, but when, one of the things, this looks really bad right on the beach but it's actually, as someone pointed out earlier, it's not as bad as if this oil got inside Tampa Bay and into the mangroves. And I think Brad was involved with getting some of that oil out of the mangroves during this spill. So uh, yes, this looks terrible, but uh, it's, it's, there, there are other things that could have happened that would have been much, much worse. So that's, that's science telling you on a fine sand beach, that oil, doesn't go very far down. It was thick oil. And um, so it was relatively easy to clean up compared to oil that got into Tampa Bay into the mangroves. So that's it. Thank you for your time.